Hi there. Um, OK, so I'm here to talk about the difficult, um, or actually simple, topics of AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and a little bit of um, artificial intelligence as well. Um, I've been working in this field for about six years now, and I've seen firsthand how um, the supercomputers that we're creating are promoting these, uh, the growth of these technologies really quickly. One of the challenges of the visual end of these technologies, augmented, virtual, and mixed reality, is to convey the power of them, um, how immersive they are, without actually letting you all have a go here today. And there are probably hundreds. It feels a little bit like thousands right now here in the audience. Um, so I'm going to take my life in my hands a tad, and we're going to try and give a live technical demo of holographic reality here on stage. So I invite my colleague, Dr. Marco, to join us, um, hopefully. <laughs> He's run. Um, technical demos. I said I'm taking my life in my hands. Um, and uh, well, effectively, what we're trying to do is switch the feed to a Microsoft HoloLens device, which Marco's wearing. Whee! He's here. <laughs> Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what a HoloLens is. Um, it's a holographic headset created by Microsoft. Um, uh, it's, it's a really powerful piece of kit. It effectively is reading the geometry of the world around it, and it allows the user um, to see holograms that are interacting with the space that it understands. And it's working. OK, great. Um, we've created a specific demo uh, just for today. It's a pretty simple demo. We've imagined what it would be like to view data um, Virgin Atlantic um, live flight data on a holographic map that Marco can interact with with gesture. OK, so it's working. So we can see what's happening. As I, as I said, the HoloLens is reading geometry of space. It can place a hologram that we've created using computers in that space. Marco can move around that space and interact with it. I mean, one of the powers of these devices, you can see it's currently tethered because we're trying to stream it to this screen, but actually it's a connected device. Um, and, and, and the power of that means it's effectively that multiple people around the world can be interacting in real time with the same hologram. So, I mean, in this, in this instance, one could imagine that air traffic controllers around the world could interact with a 3D map of data. OK, so this is an event about disruption. Um, I thought I'd start with um, a topic which feels a little bit fanciful, um, uh, and uh, um, we can... And, and with the rate of change, um, with artificial intelligence clearly being fostered by supercomputers, by super powerful computers, and the, and, and the promise of virtual reality and that it will eventually become indistinguishable from the real world around us, it sort of makes it a little bit more plausible that the concepts which seem like science fiction um, that are brought to life in films like The Matrix uh, can actually be true. Maybe we are living in a synthesized um, rea simulated reality. So it's not a new idea. Um, Plato was playing around with that concept hundreds of years ago with his cave. Um, and also a guy called Nick Bostrom, who's an Oxford le lecturer, um, released a paper in 2003 that hypothesized what we might do with supercomputers, artificial intelligence and VR, is to create simulations of human beings, conscious, sentient human beings, um, and rerun history with multiple variations. And the more supercomputing power we have, the more simulations we could run. So it raises a, a, an interesting question. Um, would, would it be more likely that we are one of the sentient conscious beings in that simulation, or are we lucky enough to be the first biological beings who are running those simulations? Make, gives me brain freeze a little bit, thinking about that. Um, uh, but in fact, it doesn't actually change anything. Even if we are in a simulation right now, a virtual simulation, um, and if, for example, I was a Buddhist, I might believe in rebirth. It's not really different to reboot. OK, um, that's probably enough of the fanciful speculation around simulation theory, um, as cool and, and weird as that is. Um, Bring it back to reality, what I want to try to cover now um, are the topics of augmented, virtual, and mixed reality. 
um, how they're being used in meaningful ways already today, and actually raise a word of warning about their use in future. And I'm going to shirk a little bit of responsibility. Um, I'm going to point the finger to other people whose responsibility for caring for those technologies in the future it is. Okay, this looks like a bit of a dull slide. Um, if there's anyone out there who's currently wondering what is he talking about, what is mixed reality, what is augmented reality, what's the difference, this continuum um, hopefully will go some way to explaining the difference in those technologies. <clears throat> so here on the left-hand side, we have reality, um, or the reality that we perceive around us, that we've known for years. Next up, we have augmented reality. Um, uh, so obviously, that's pretty topical. We've got Pokemon Go, which has hit the news pretty hard over the past months. Augmented reality is when we're adding augmented assets to a live camera feed, and that's generally on a mobile device. Next up, um, and this is the Microsoft HoloLens, which does work, I promise, um, that's augmented virtuality. So that's when the device that's mediating between my brain and the real world actually understands the world around it. It's merging realities. And finally, virtual reality, uh, which is, I think, the poster boy of this suite of technologies at the moment. Um, and that's potentially the most isolating of technologies. This is a linear continuum. Um, it, it goes from reality to virtuality. It's a spectrum. Um, but it could be argued that it should be circular. When virtuality becomes indistinguishable from the real world, it becomes reality, It's my view, at least. OK, so um, we're going to be hearing a lot about VR gaming over the coming months, um, uh, and particularly with Sony PlayStation VR launching to market, I think, on the 13th of October. But it's my view um, that this quote from Palmer Luckey uh, is not going to be held up by just VR gaming and entertainment. It's the meaningful uses of virtual reality across every walk of life that's going to help that stick. Palmer um, Palmer's the founder of Oculus Rift, um, which is, I think, probably the most well-known VR headset on the market at the moment. Uh, Oculus Rift was purchased by Facebook about two years ago now for two billion US dollars, um, which sort of gives an insight into what big business, um, what businesses are thinking about virtual reality. It's here to stay. Two years prior to the purchase of Facebook for $2 billion, it was kick-started um, to the tune of two and a half million US dollars. So you can see that's a pretty meteoric um, journey uh, that this particular headset and company has been on over the last four or so years. OK. <clears throat> so I mentioned the meaningful uses of um, these technologies. So you can see our very own Tim Peake on the International Space Station, wearing the HoloLens. This was a test. Um, the guys sent up the HoloLens, and it was a test to see how it could work. Um, so imagine a scenario. Um, Tim's on the space station. He needs to undertake some repairs on the space station that he doesn't innately know how to do. I'm back on Earth um, in, in Fort Lauderdale. I'm with NASA. And I can instruct him by viewing his vision. I can see what Tim is seeing, and I can annotate in his vision in real time. Um, so that's what holographic reality, or mixed reality, the HoloLens would allow me to do. My knowledge of spaceships probably wouldn't. OK, um, and another meaningful use, which I think is really powerful, is, is how VR and these technologies are being used in healthcare. Um, so the treatment of, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, when we can uh, offer the sufferers the ability to re-engage with the things that are causing the PTSD in a controlled and immersive way, gradually helping them overcome the disorder. Similar use case with phobia treatment as well. OK, so some doctors at the... Um, scientists at the University of Washington um, have created VR games to help um, people who are going through painful hospital treatments um, deal with that treatment. Uh, so what, we've, what they've found is that, firstly, um, the patients being asked, when have it, having had VR during the treatment, um, what it was like, uh, they were less anxious going into the treatment. And in fact, 
stated they felt less pain.、Um, so these are fMRI scans of the brain,、um, which sort of brings to life how VR is helping.、Um, on the left hand, on the right hand side, you can see an fMRI scan of a patient using VR during a painful procedure. On the left hand side. You can see that there's more brain activity that's related to pain. So, firstly, they told us, or they told the doctors, that they're feeling less pain, and it's corroborated by these MRI scans. And in education,、um, I think personally, I think this is one of the most powerful uses of virtual reality,、um, uh, with programs such as Google Expeditions. And I know Google Expeditions was part of the previous Virgin Disruptors event.、Um, This is where、um, 30 or so Google Cardboard headsets are distributed to a class of pupils, and the teacher can control the content from 360 3D panoramas that are delivered to those students in real time, and actually annotate those as well, bringing to life points of interest.、Um, so, very immersive, immersive journey of discovery. <clears throat> We use this quote quite a lot when talking about the power of virtual reality in education. And also in general,、um, we use it a lot.、Uh, it's purportedly Confucius, but I don't think anyone can can, can actually tell us that's true.、Um, it says, "Tell me, and I will forget; show me, and I may remember; involve me, and I'll understand." And a note to the marketeers in the room:、um, This is sort of predominantly what my company, Happy Finish, does. We we use these technologies to convey brands to their audiences.、Um, Uh, this is just something we worked on recently.、Um, Nielsen released a report two or three weeks ago,、um, and it's statistics, of course.、Uh, but VR and 360-degree video prompts 28 times more brand recall than when that brand appears in traditional advertising.、Um, and the recall of 360-degree content in general is eight times higher, and consumers are three times as likely to buy after seeing an ad in virtual reality. Personally, I hope that's true. Okay, so it's my view and many others' view that we're we're sat here. That works great.、Um, we're here,、um, and we're seeing this this rise to the plateau, plateau of productivity with these technologies. But I think we're about to go here.、Um, it's about to go really big,、um, and and it's hard to speculate what cool new uses of these technologies we'll discover in the coming months and years.、Um, but with that opportunity, also comes some risk. And that's the risk that we'll be living. This is a film by filmmaker Kitsune Matsuda. Thank you.、Um, it's his vision of an overloaded hyper reality.、Um, and the risk is that we we could be brainwashed by this stuff. It could be everywhere. We could be. It could be a sensory overload. Personally, I hope we don't get there. And it's the responsibility of all of us who are creating this content, and many of us will be creating this content in future, to make sure we don't go there. I was in a think tank recently with、uh, senior management of a, a major UK transportation hub,、um, and I showed you this video and I made this point.、Um, and in fact,、uh, the guys in the room came back to me and said, "No, actually, that that is our vision for our transportation hub in future." And it rang quite a lot of alarm bells with me. Okay, <laughs> other experts,、um, uh, myself and my team get referred to expert referred to as experts quite a lot.、Um, quite a lot. I'd argue that in an embryonic, fast-moving technology space, it's very difficult to become experts.、Um, you have to keep moving.、Uh, and yeah, you saw it already. I gave it away. <laughs>、uh, and, and we have this mentality. It's a little bit of Silicon Valley mentality, actually, that you've got to fail fast and learn fast.、Um, in, in the pursuit of innovating with these technologies, it gets better.、Um, with these technologies, you've got to be afraid not to fail. And that's somewhat of a, a youthful abandon.、Um, be willing to take on challenges, knowing that the result might be that you fail.、Um, and it's to myself and Dr. Mar Marco's somewhat distaste that the average age of my team working on these technologies is 24 at the moment. And I think we bring that age up a little bit. So.、Um, Really, the duty of caring for these technologies will come down 
to, and the, the duty of making sure we don't end up in that horrible hyper-reality will come down to the generations which are growing up with these technologies being ubiquitous, um, who will know how to leverage them and immerse other people in worlds of their making. Um, and as we know, uh, with other mediums in the past, um, those who can make us believe something with the use of a medium can, can will us to do, us, do what they want us to do. Um, and, and that's quite a big danger. So I'll just round up on, on talking about convergence a little bit. Um, and whether it's the virtual, augmented, mixed, or the real reality, what I'm seeing, and I think what we're all going to start seeing, is they're going to merge into one. Um, and, and, and just to that point, who's going to control this, and, and why there's a duty of care in that control? I know this isn't Oscar Wilde, by the way, it's Gene, um, Gene Wilder, and it's just a little bit of homage to the great comedian. But Oscar Wilde said, one's real life is so often the life that one does not lead. And a little bit of a disruptive image to finish on. Thank you.